and welcome to School of Hustle. I'm your host, Sarah, and this is the show where we chat with everyday entrepreneurs about everything that goes into starting a new venture. Today's guest has made strides in pushing the boundaries of the sexual wellness industry. Eva Goykochea started Maud in 2018 after feeling frustrated with how outdated the family planning aisle had consistently become wherever she went. So she decided to converge her work experience and create a modern sexual wellness company that is built on quality, simplicity, and inclusivity. And her goal is to make intimacy better for all people. Welcome, Eva. It is great to have you on the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. It's wonderful to be in your beautiful apartment. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, this is plexiglass. I and with our jail cell plexiglass. <laughs> So, Eva, I've heard a lot about your company. I've investigated a lot. <laughs> I've checked out some of the products. I would love to hear your story of why you decided to start this. Yeah, I mean, so without totally revealing my age, um, <laughs> I have been working for a very long time. Um, no, I was a legislative aide in healthcare in my early 20s. Okay. Uh, I studied marketing in New York, actually. So this is the second time I lived in New York. Yeah. Um, and I started working in marketing after mm -hmm. I left politics and, and mm -hmm. started working for a lot of startups and with really cool brands. And my interest was like, how can I work for a company that converges healthcare and sort of this startup consumer friendly yeah. facing brand and sexual wellness is extremely outdated. The same yeah. brands, a hundred years. It's like, it's so true. It's so boring on the aisle. And yeah. I thought that this was something that for me, made such an impact on mm -hmm. many levels that, mm -hmm. that I decided to pursue it. I did not think that, like, it was an idea, and then all of a sudden, here we are. But Now, here we are. Yeah. Only two years later. Well, I started working on 2015, but we launched in 2018. Okay. But yeah. still, yeah. that's a huge success story. And today, you have many employees. You sell in, how, how many stores do you sell in? I think we're in, like, 140 stores, but we're mostly D to C. So we're mostly a consumer Right, because people can go to your site and buy all the goods there. Yeah. Um, now with sexual wellness, I feel like mm -hmm. there's a lot of experimenting involved mm -hmm. in that and what you exactly want to make, how to make it, the products. Um, what's that process like? Because I imagine there's, there's a lot of certifications you may need. There's a lot of experimenting you may need with different products to figure out what really needs to be updated. Yeah, so the idea was launch with the basics and yeah. create a brand that matters to people with yeah. the basics. Okay, so you you created the con the all of the different products. Now, um, tell me about the process of of bringing that actually to market, right? So, like, how do you market something like this? How do you stand out from other people? I mean, the idea was first of all, we did a really big survey to sort of test if this was even something that people wanted. Yeah. And everyone, which is so good by the way. Yeah, there I was did, a lot of interesting feedback. Yeah. Um and a lot of it was the same. Like people everywhere from 18 to 80 were in this survey, men mm -hmm. and women, other, gay straight other, wow. and they all said the same thing, which is like current brands are they're really explicit, they're really mm -hmm. misogynistic, they're really outdated. Yeah. The packaging is just like so I thought, look, this is a viable idea. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also a really emotional category. So if you yeah. can create something that really matters to a person and you're creating these like really great basics, you can sort of build a company off of it. And yeah. the way that we differentiate ourselves is by having that emotional connection and that brand equity. Uh, yeah, and I think I noticed that when I look at your social media and your marketing strategy, you, you use the word misogynistic for all, other companies, yeah. some companies, right? And that's actually one of the things that I was really inspired by, how you kind of do put um, women first in many situations and it's like women are powerful. And that is such, um, a great thing to see in this industry because it's not something you normally see. No. And, and you know, it's, it's, out, it's an outdated mindset. It's an outdated mindset and even like the joke around family planning. I mean, we yeah. put that on the site to sort of say, it's called family planning. Like this is, yeah. we're in 2020. Yeah. And I, I know we feel a little like we're going backwards at the top. But, um, but I will say like, we are gender inclusive. Yeah. Our audience is almost split to the site and we, a lot of people are in relationships. So yeah. we're really getting to both 
genders. Um, and then we're also inclusive of the gender spectrum because that's not something that really gets talked about. Right, either. and that's so, on the site too, by the way. Like that's one of the things that pop out and that also is not addressed in other sexual wellness companies. No, they're really gendered. And this yeah. idea, it's not, we always make like the comment, it's not about being so forward thinking and that the product isn't for a specific, you know, yeah. they are male condoms. They are, you know, they right. have a Obviously, usage. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> but the idea is like sex and gender aren't always correlated. Totally. So, and your products actually speaking to that, a lot of um, sexual wellness companies, it'll be like a pink thing for a girl mm -hmm. and a blue thing for a boy. Mm -hmm. Yours are not like that. Yours are very, they look very luxurious. Tell me about designing packaging, because that's a big part of, of branding as well, is designing your logo, designing the packaging. How, do you, how did you start that? So it's interesting, because Mod has gone through multiple lives. Yeah. It, well, like when I first started, it was blue. It was like really blue. Okay. Um, and the, the idea was for it to stand out on the shelf. And as we yeah. started going through this process of like, what do we really stand for? Mm -hmm. I think the packaging started to become the thing that really cuts through the noise. Yeah by being neutral. Mm -hmm. So many lives later, um, we worked with the designer to create the symbols and then we worked with other designers who we still work with uh, to create the packaging. And But we basically do everything in house like hand in hand with those people. It's not like wow. we worked with an agency to go through the whole process. I created the brand book. That's where I come from. Um, so your professional career helped you launch this. In what ways did that career helped prepare you for a career in entrepreneurship. Well, so it's funny. I ended up getting my degree in organizational communication, which mm -hmm. I didn't, I knew it mattered. I care about how this, yeah. you know, the structure of companies and sort of the communication and culture building, but I yeah. didn't realize how much this would come into play later. Yeah. Um, and then understanding like healthcare policy and how you navigate your own wellness. Right. And so those things were really foundational. And then I went on to help people build brands. And I was like a really employee at Everlane and I worked for an organic cosmetic company. And so this marrying of product mm -hmm. and like really what those products mean in someone's life, especially yeah. when it's about wellness and health, yeah. um, was what prepared me for this. So why did you want to become an entrepreneur and take on all of that? Cause in many ways it is easier working for someone else, but it's so much more enjoyable working for yourself. Yeah. I mean, I think, if I saw a company like Maud in the world, I would have gone to work there. Because yeah. when I left Everlane, the idea was like, go work for a company that you believe in. Yeah. Um, I believed in Everlane, but it was like, I don't care about clothing. I care about health. And so right. uh, I built a company I wanted to work for. And like, That's I great. enjoy being an entrepreneur and, and it's, it's about people and some some days you feel like you you want to throw your hands up and be like I don't know I'm I also out. a person <laughs> I know, right but like, I, yeah. think that, um, <laughs> I think this idea of doing something that really matters that I could wake up every single day and do and I know that's super cliche to say like was what I wanted yeah and so I, I completely mind. understand yeah once you have something you're so passionate about you can't even imagine going back and working for someone no. else and, no. and that's the beauty of running your own business. Yeah. Yeah. So why call it Maud? <laughs> so Maud was this play on modern. Oh, okay. Um, Maud means strength in battle. It uh, it also was Ooh. kind of a, a nod to the show Maud, which was really, it pushed the boundary at the time yeah. for reproductive rights. Yes. And then also the real backstory is that, I won't go into it too much, but there was a prohibition era for condoms and all of this beautiful packaging came out of that time because they were trying to stay under the radar. And there was a brand that wasn't by any means like the prettiest of the bunch, but it was <laughs> called Three Merry Widows. And if you open the packaging- <laughs> Three Married Widows. Three Merry Widows. Oh, yeah. three, I was like, <laughs> three, okay. No, um, and their names are Agnes, Becky, and Mabel. And I was like, I feel like Maude would have been the fourth widow. So, yeah, yeah, totally. So sort of, it was all of those things. Launching your own business can be very expensive. So how did you get the funding to launch something like this? That's a big question. Um, I know, it's, the, it's often the hardest part. It was yeah. really hard, yeah. yeah. I I moved to New York for Mod. Like I oh. wanted to build Mod. I was ready, I sold my house in LA. I moved for Mod, and the idea was to start fundraising and build out network, but I came really with no network to do that. Yeah. And, um, and it just started with one conversation that led to another. And mm -hmm. in 2017, I raised my first round of funding. It was yeah. gonna be 250,000 and we raised 550,000. Wow, congrats. It's and 
congrats, imagine. but it also is incredibly like when stressful. you're talking, it's stressful, but it's also, if that's not the math you anticipated, then yeah. you are really diluting yourself. So, right. um, yeah. Tell so. me about that funding. Um, it, it's can be very overwhelming for people. So where do you get it to like, who do you talk to? What do you do to make sure you're using the money in the right ways once you get it? Yeah. I mean, so for me, there was a couple of things that I did that really helped set the tone. Mm -hmm. Um, the first one is I joined like an accelerator in the summer. It wasn't an accelerator that takes equity, which was good. So I was just able to be around other entrepreneurs and ask a lot of mm. questions. When you say an accelerator, mm -hmm. what exactly is that? An accelerator is usually a program um, that will incubate a startup and give you access to an office or access to capital. Oh. Sometimes they take a percentage of the company um, mm. sort of to give you the tools you need to launch. What were you feeling during this time? <laughs> well, so it's interesting. The night that we launched, it was April 2nd, 2018. And I stayed up all night with a developer. I walked outside and there was snow on the ground with daffodils growing. Oh my and God. so like permanently imprinted in my brain so that I, I know it was amazing. Um, so there were a lot of sleepless nights. I also really wanted to be committed to as typical as it sounds like a work-life balance mm -hmm. and making sure that I wasn't just work. Cause at some point in the middle of the night, like your brain shuts off. There's no way that you you're useful anymore. You can't be thinking constantly. Yeah. Yeah. And you need to rest your body. You need yeah. to rest your brain. Totally. Yeah. So we have good work life balance now. That's good. Um, we go home at 6.30, which is kind of unheard of in startup land. But... And in New York. <laughs> well, yeah. It's true. Yeah. But I think that ability to sort of maintain balance also goes back to the ethos of the company, yeah. which is to make time for intimacy. So what would you say is the most shocking thing about the sexual wellness industry that people don't normally expect? I think one is they don't realize how few brands there are. Like really <laughs> Trojan owns 70% of the market. No way. Yeah. There are many, and, and many you probably haven't heard of, but really there are three major condom companies that mm -hmm. everyone knows. So it's Trojan Directs and Lifestyles. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It, it's been totally owned by brands in a way that actually has this trickle down effect to how people feel about themselves yeah. sexually, right? And yeah. we compartmentalize it and we're uncomfortable and we don't have these conversations around the dinner table. Right. And I think like, you know, the point for us was to really create a brand that could be like a dinner table conversation. You yeah. could talk to your teenager about sex. You can talk to your partner. You can be over 50 and not feel like suddenly, you know, sex isn't something that you should mm -hmm. think about. And I think that that's like mods really trying to, yes, we're a product company, but we're also really trying to shift culture yeah. and communication. And so what has been the most surprising thing that's happened in running your business so far? Oh God, what's the most surprising thing? I mean, I think it's that if, if things can go wrong, they'll go wrong. Yeah. You're like, we have this supply chain figured mm -hmm. out. Well, COVID, <laughs> COVID's, a, COVID's oh a good one. Um, yeah. No, I think like supply chain and just making sure that you like really cross your T's and dot your I's. And even mm -hmm. then it doesn't ensure that everything's going to go perfectly well. So being resilient, not taking it so seriously, just being a malleable like person who can sort of go along with the stuff that's going to You just got to take like, the oh, punches yeah. and go mm -hmm. um, because failing is part of entrepreneurship and you just learn from failure and move on. If you get totally. stuck on it, that's when things don't do anything because you're stuck on it. Yeah. And I think like, when people want to raise money, I always want to ask questions around like, personally, are they prepared? Because yeah. it is a lot of rejection. I mean, it's like being in entertainment. Oh like there's a ton of rejection. So much rejection. It's easy to maybe take personally. Um, and so you kind of have to be ready to just be told no. And you have to be able to have a very thick skin too. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people need to understand that before they decide to start their business. Yep. It's normally what weeds out people that won't succeed very quickly is yeah. just is the the constant rejection i mean it's it's you get rejected more than you you get successful totally uh so it's a, like what would you say is the best way to deal with that as someone that isn't used to that rejection but still wants to start their own business and needs to get used to it <laughs> i think get it's used to it. i know I, I think there's a lot of myopia around like you think it's a good idea. That doesn't mean that everybody else thinks it's a good idea. Yeah. And it's okay if they don't, because if they thought it was a good idea, it probably already, somebody already came up with it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one is like understanding that not everyone's going to like your idea, but also understanding who's the right fit 
to go to for funding? Who's the right fit? It's like dating. Like, who's the right <laughs> fit to go to for funding? And who's and are they going to like you? Like, put it, get yourself outside of your, your own head and say, yeah. like, is this the right match? Is this going to be a reciprocal relationship? So did you have an idea for Maud? And then after the survey, you realized, actually, I think we should do a little bit differently in this direction. Or was what you had envisioned pretty much what the survey also told you? It was what the survey also told us, but I think the what I was saying earlier about going through iterations on the brand, that mm -hmm. was, there were a lot of decisions that had to be made around like, okay, well, the second version of Mod was really colorful and that's sort of impossible to get to market because it's very expensive. Mm, um, why and then, is it expensive? Because if you're printing all of these different colors, if you're doing all of these oh. different runs, like it's so, and then we realized, well, look, if the if the whole thing is to be really universal and this company that stands for all people, like color does matter. Yeah. And maybe it's not in showing every color that's going to bring them into right. the fold. Maybe it's in being more simple. So mm -hmm. those things were happening sort of at the same time. The other so, thing I was going to say is business model yeah. and like unit economics, which nobody really yeah tell me likes about to that. hear. It's um, not a very exciting topic, but it's a super important topic. It's an important topic because not every company should fundraise because they don't have the unit economics to do it mm -hmm. um, or the business model to do it. So it's mm -hmm. like, okay, so now you have a thick skin. You think it's a good idea. Yeah. Is it actually a good idea on paper? Yeah. Like, is the math there? Right. And that's really important. Actually, speaking of which, was there an aha moment for you? There was an what aha moment. What was it? So... Between leaving Everlane and I started working for for other brands, like I was yeah. um, I was helping them build their brands, get their websites <clears throat> off the ground, and I um, worked with this designer duo. We started this little wash company. It mm -hmm. was great. It still kind of exists. Um, and they started talking about sexual wellness, and I was oh. like, Oh my god, this is the idea I've been waiting my entire career for because oh. this matters so much to me. Yeah. I come from a state that's forty eighth, like on the list of usage for condoms. I have, you know, there are oh, wow. many teenage pregnancies in my family. Um, and so for me, it was this really like, like, well, moment of, I want to do this. Do you mm -hmm. want to do this? And not everybody was on board. No, you know, not mm -hmm. everybody oh, wanted cool. to sell condoms and tell their grandma that's what they did. <laughs> um, my very Catholic grandma is now okay with it, but it took a while. Um, <laughs> so yeah, if there was a light bulb moment and it was a conversation and it was, at the time, it seemed like so far out of reach and so impossible yeah. that it just was a conversation. Yep, and that's normally where it starts. Yeah. Do you have any advice for aspiring entrepreneurs? Yeah, I mean, do your homework and, yeah. and you know, maybe you don't want to take the Harvard course, but there are definitely like courses online. There, are, Coursera is a good resource. Mm -hmm. There's like other resources where you can start to learn more about what you're building and mm -hmm. Google it. I Google it. It's the greatest. You can learn so much on YouTube these days. Yeah. How long it took to get off the ground was really my, it was the time learning. It was the time yes. educating myself and getting told no. And, and being poor for a long time. <laughs> well, I still don't make much money. That's another big, like, money. Just so you know, you're not going to make a lot of money if you're a startup founder. Yeah. You I'm have, in a dual income household years. with the husband of 10 years. Thank you, Ian, for like helping us pay the rent. Yeah. I mean, every, once you finally get there, and you achieve your dreams in yeah. this company. Every um, every tear you shed, every challenge, every second second guess, it's all worth it because there's nothing like being so pleased with what you built. So it's been wonderful having you on the show, Emma. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to everyone out there who tuned in today. If you want to learn more about Maud, visit getmaud.com. Follow them on Instagram and getmaud. And that is all for this edition of School of Hustle. You can keep up with all of our episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you stream and download podcasts. And if you do like what you hear today, please consider leaving a review, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our show. We'll see you next time. Bye.